All right. Yeah, thanks, Lorenzo. Um, it's a pleasure for us to be here today, sitting on stage this time, not in the audience. I know it's a big honor, actually, to be here. Um, everybody here is super smart, and yeah, we kind of feel a little bit out of place. I will try and put in a good show for you. You know, this is the, the, the last talk before lunch, so blood sugar levels must be low, and we'll, we have a live demo coming up, so, you know, woo, risk risk and, and some fun for you guys to see. Um, so this is the first time we get to show off what we've been working on for the last few years in a conference. So it's a really, really big day for us. And um, I hope you're, you bear with us and, and are as excited as we are about what we're about to show. Uh, Digital Samba has been around for about 20 years. Um, we've been building video conferencing platforms pretty much from the beginning. We always thought that you know the logical thing for us as software people was always that things should be easily accessible and uh, accessible from the browser is that what that meant for us there should not be any software and um you know back then it was flash uh, now it's webrtc and of course it's made the world um, a lot better um we love building great products uh we love having amazing ui and we also love developers because that's what we are at heart so what we wanted to do is um, now that video conferencing became mainstream is we wanted to allow developers, not necessarily in a web RTC or video conferencing developers, but all other types of developers to add video conferencing to their applications with just a couple of lines of code. And that was just a logical step, next step for us. You know, we, we understood now that everybody understood the power of video conferencing that obviously people must now be thinking, how can I add video to my application? We've been using Zoom, we've been using Teams. Um, there must be a way for me to be able to add this to my particular vertical, you know, that particular use case. And not everybody has an amazing video conferencing development team because that it is what it takes to, to build a great video conferencing platform. So we thought the world is missing a simple widget, something that you can add to your application with just a couple of lines of code. And we wanted something that's gold standard, you know, something that allows up to 100 uh, video conferencing users, all with their camera on, 49 uh, uh, streams per page. You know, that's what people see in Zoom and Teams. You should have nothing less. We wanted to be able to use for virtual classrooms, for webinars. So our platform allows up to 2,000 users with 15 broadcasters. You can configure it whichever way you want. You can customize it. And um, yeah, so we're going to show you this today, Connell. Um, his team colleague is our head of operations, and I founded the company uh, about 20 years ago. Um, so this is the typical journey that companies tend to go through. And please apologize, apologies for my awful handwriting, but um, on the we do have a y-axis. Um, y-axis is cost in this case, and the x-axis is uh, customizability. So in the bottom left, you have off-the-shelf solutions such as Zoom and Teams. Uh, that's kind of where it starts, and people think. Maybe they you know, use some kind of a tool like Calendly to add video conferencing to their application. And um, then they think, but we can do better. You know, we want to have something much more integrated. We want to have a seamless user experience between my application and the video conferencing piece. So then typically they go all the way up to a lot of side of the spectrum and start to think, um, okay, I can build this myself. WebRTC, it's easy. And I can just uh, connect a couple of peers together and maybe then they figure out, hey, maybe, you know, you know, I need turn and there are a whole bunch of other components signaling. What is all of this nonsense? That sounds very complicated. And then they find some virtual um, video platform as a service, such as Agora or Daily, um, which also, you know, now solves some of the issues, but it's still a long, long way from a full uh, video conferencing experience with remote muting, you know, user management roles, all the other features that you've seen in, in, in Zoom and Teams. Uh, you're, you're way, way, you're really far away from that. Um, you know, Simon's uh, speech was all about university courses and, and, and how hard it is to build WebRTC. So there must be an easier way. And we figured what we'll do is we'll put something into the middle of that. A pre-built component that you can add to your application. And of course, that also comes with some limitations. You know, we, we, um, by giving you a pre-built component, you lose some customizability, some flexibility. So we add an SDK layer on top of it, a JavaScript SDK, which allows you to customize it, to brand it, to make it look like it's yours. And this SDK also feeds information back into your application. So it has to be a full circle, not just the creation of the tool, but also get information back out of it. And we're going to show you a, a lot of um, how all of these things work and look. So, 
This is what our front end looks like. Um, at first glance, it's you know, a standard video conferencing uh, application with a ton of different components. It has a lot of features built in. It's got your user roles, which I think is you know, a very important piece, especially once you start to run larger sessions. You can configure all of this. Um, we, we spend, and you know, another thing that's very important about the way we built Digital Samba is that it's um, uh, built with a privacy first mindset. Um, and this is something that we think is extremely important in the time that we live in today. Uh, we're seeing the advent of artificial intelligence, which is able to read and listen to pretty much everything that we talk about. It can transcribe it to text. We're not starting to run it through other LNMs. We must be conscious of where this information that we're sharing over the internet, you know, over video calls, uh, where we do a lot of private stuff, uh, psychotherapy sessions, for example, um, or even a lot of business secrets get shared this way. We should be very, very conscious about where all this information sits. Um, and this is something that is part of uh, the digital Samba promise. You know? um, so for example, we also use Janus's insertable streams technology for end-to-end -end encryption. Um, we, we use a lot of, of, or pretty much all of the Janus uh, capabilities that we can get. Uh, I will definitely want to talk to you, uh, Lorenzo, about bandwidth estimations. That's something that we're, we're not currently doing, but would be interested in, in looking into. Um, so here's like a, you know, a use case that uh, is built with Digital Samba, where you can see that the video conference is a central piece of a larger application. In this case, it's a telemedical um, application. The company that uses Digital Samba to integrate or to make video conferencing part of their, of their promise uh, should be able to trust us, you know, should be able to understand wh where, where the information flows, of that of its patients flows, and um, privacy is very much ingrained into a Digital Samba's company. We're a European company, we live in, in, on a continent which has the strongest uh, privacy framework. So this goes way beyond just technology, but also uh, very much involves legal considerations. So here's how we think this should work. Uh, you plug into Digital Samba via the API, and then you tune it or fine tune it uh, via the SDK. We really try to abstract everything, uh, give you access as developers with very simple API calls, and um, even AI in this case is built in. And we're going to be showing we're going to be showing we're demoing this uh, today as well for the for the very first time. Um, so here is our promise: uh, add videos, video conferencing to your application in minutes uh, rather than months. And we're going to put our money where our mouth is now and uh, show you how it's done. So finally, we can show some some code, something a little bit more interesting. Uh, you see over here just a very simple PHP piece of code, uh, which is in this case a post, uh, which is, that's all it takes to create a, video, a digital Samba video conferencing room. Um, the dashboard that we delivered to you looks like this. Um, you can basically see that these are rooms that I've created previously. Uh, the application comes with a bunch of uh, statistics and like you basically have a dashboard where you have full control over what is happening within all of your sessions. It goes beyond the scope of this call to be able to look at all of these, all of the features that it has, but you can look at past sessions um, and each session then has information associated to it where you have a stream of all the usage that happened within that session for troubleshooting and so on. And all of this information is available to you via API calls as developers as well. So you, you know, again, get a very abstracted view of what's happening within, within your platform. So if we now look at um, the simple PHP application that I showed, Super simple, uh, I click a button, and if the internet is working. Second, please. Then we have instantiated the room. Unfortunately, the pop-up didn't work, but um, uh, that is how it is with live demos. Let's try that one more time. So you can see that uh, when I press the start, video call button. Yeah, this is the digital Samba call being instantiated in real time. Um, and I'm not going to go into the room right now because that's going to be part of Colin's piece. But uh, that's all it takes uh, to, to generate a digital Samba call. So yeah, as I showed you over here, this then fires against our API and creates the, creates the room. Um, and the room itself comes with a ton of configuration options. We only showed a few here, but this is really where you can configure how you want the session to work for you for your particular use case. You can brand it, you can configure it, you can, so these are the parameters that I had passed in just now. 
Um, you can choose which features you want to have, and you have an intricate uh, role system, and of course, recordings and so on. Pretty much everything you want and expect uh, from, from a Teams or Zoom call. So, Colin, at this point, I'll hand over to you for your demo. Yeah. Uh, okay, so as Rob has, has been explaining, we see our job as a, as a service provider to abstract all this complex web RTC stuff. And, uh, provides simple tools for developers to put um, video conferencing and webinars under their, under their website. Um, uh, the challenge I had been set here was to get it into as few lines of code as possible. And that's what this demo is going to consist of. And I'll just run through this. Right, so I have a very simple web page. Here, I load our SDK, and I also have a little script that I'm going to work on. Um, our SDK works on elements that are on the DOM, so we need to fair the loading of that script until all M elements are loaded. Um, I'll show you a little web page. I have a form this for pink devs, but just don't interrogate me too much on that. So that's my sample web page, and I just want to embed uh, video conferencing into that. Uh, so my script is here. I've just pre-made a couple lines of code. Right, so these first couple of lines, I'm uh, just set up a couple of variables. I'm accepting one variable, this embed element variable, and I'm picking up my nice pink div from my web page, and that's how I'm going to refer to that div going forward. Um, also, the room URL is going to relate to a room on the platform, which Rob's already shown how to create that. Typically, this is going to be created through the API. Um, okay. So our pre-built model is all iframe based, and our, our SDK gives you a range of options that they, they embed this iframe onto your website. From here, I have set up another variable. Whoops. Taking huge rats trying to do this live, but it's simple enough. Okay, so this is another variable, with the Samba frame, and this is an instance, this is a, of our a, a, a digital Samba embedded class. So I'm creating an object from this class. Um, I'm just setting on a couple of initial parameters that have shown our room URL parameter and the embed element, which is the div where I want to embed the, the conference onto. We have another set of little properties which I need to set before I can put the uh, load the, the iframe onto my element. This is Antis props. This is just we tell the the class some stuff about the iframe. So I just make a, a borderless iframe and take up the full width and height of the of the div. Um, and then the last thing is we call the load method to just basically load our Samba frame using these little sample properties that we've set up. Um, so we have to hope that's going to work. Uh, so there it is. Um, that just loads video conferencing onto my site. And because we're pre-built, uh, um, we have a range of tools. It's just probably worth references. We have a whiteboard captioning. And these are tools that developers can just, oh, there we go. I, I want the Q&A. And we, we've built all these tools for them, so they don't have to go away and build them themselves. Um, I will quickly. So that's... So that's at roughly about four lines. I, my challenge was to get video comments on their website in as few lines possible. I've done it in about four. I probably could have shortcutted that further if I had a, hadn't had created, referred to my variables in a slightly different way. I will try and now to reduce our SDK down to something as basic as this, I find is a bit sad because we have dozens and dozens of uh, properties, events, and methods that you can call from this this SDK. 
I will just briefly show a couple of these and just show how we're going to we're empowering developers to, to create interesting video enabled applications on their website. Um, so it's going to stay this little bit. This is another property we have is the room settings and i'm just going to disable the show on the, the toolbar because i just want to show how we can allow developers to create their own controls on their website they did to, to control their their video conference this token is effectively how you you set identities of your of your connected user in the real world you'll probably have some server side component generating this token uh, and then loading them into the front end in the context of the, the user. That they have like roles, you know, the, the, the username and all the little bits that I will not bore people with. Um, uh, so these are just some controls. I was just dabbling around that I pre made. So you can see here the listeners. So I just created a, a couple of. It does here at the bottom, I'll show you in a little second, um, on click listeners. So whenever these, we, we call the Samba frame object again, and we're calling these methods, toggle video, toggle audio, toggle captions, start screen share. I'm sure you can see, we like to think we've made this really simple for developers. No, there's no odd terms. So we just try to simplify everything. Um, so, I think it's control. Uh, so you see this time we went straight under the conference under this identity that the token allowed for rather than the little login screen. And I have just some very basic controls down here. I can turn off my video. I can turn it on. We can turn on captions. We can turn them off and, you know, et cetera. So, it's just to give you a flavor. As I say, I'm a bit sad because you can see the methods with dozens of them. Um, it's just to give you a flavor of, of, you know, the power that we think this SDK gives developers. Um, yeah, so let me close that one though. Where are we going from here, Rob? Good. Yeah, yeah, you want the laptop again? All right, thanks, Connell. So um, we tried to show here how, how easy it is to add a video conference to your, to your application, but then also customize it and, um, and, and, and make, it, make it yours, right? Because um, as, as product builders, at the end of the day, you want to make sure that this thing feels and acts the way that you want it to, um, and not, not as maybe some third-party tools such as Zoom or Teams did. So how does all of this thing, how does this thing work uh, under the hood? Um, that's on, under our bonnet uh, over here. Um, it's obviously uh, not the simplest tech stack, but at the same time, it's a similar tech stack to what you just saw um, previously, and you've probably seen in many other, uh, if you've built this type of application, and that's kind of where you're gonna end up. We don't really do any magic there. Um, what's special about it is that we do everything with this privacy first and European mindset. So we specifically do not work with AWS or any of the other US hyperscalers. We make sure that all data, you know, we, we believe data sovereignty is important in Europe. Um, we make sure we work only with European providers. Uh, we handpicked uh, European providers in this case. So we work with LeaseWeb uh, for our uh, bare metals and we work with um, Scaleway and Exoscale as a fallback for all of the, you know, um, the scaling stuff. These are these are very exciting companies that I also recommend that you have a look at if, if you're looking to work with European providers instead of US. It's uh, similar, you know, it's, it's an easy transition from one to the other. Um, so yeah, as, as we, you know, by going with digital Samba rather than building your own, you save yourself the headaches of having to do all of this stuff uh, yourself. Um, this slide uh, just really shows that the, you know, the path to success is never a straight line. Um, we've heard this a few times as well before already. You know, many things happen over the years, technologies change. You guys at Janus were saying that version numbers are important. I cannot stress that enough. We went with Corento first because they had a high version number. 
that really bit us in the behind because uh, it uh, really was not stable. We could not get it to work. We tried really hard and um, we had to basically take the heart out of our, you know, it was like you know, operating on a live patient and switching out the heart. Um, we wanted to go with Jitsi at some point, which is an incredible project. And we'll be talking more about um, Sal's project uh, a little bit later on as well. Uh, it did not allow us the level of customizability that we had envisaged at the time. And only then did we find Janus, you know, so we wish we would have found Janus earlier. And I think there's, there's no turning back for us. Um, uh, Janus is also a sovereign company, which, which again is something that's very important to us. Uh, we love Janus, happy 10th birthday, Janus. So I think we're all here to celebrate and Conal, maybe you can talk a little bit more about um, what our experience with, with Janus was. Yeah. So, as I said, we, we, we made a couple, I won't call them mistakes, I'll just call them missteps with some of the previous media engines that we'd cho chosen. But once we found Janus, we, we just liked everything about it. Uh, we liked the community, we liked Lorenzo and his team. Um, it's been, I, mean, I suppose, the most critical thing uh, as, as, as a business and you're trying to please users, you know, it needs to be reliable and the performance needs to be there. and for the most part, Janice, it's done the force, and we've no reason to throw it out. We went, um, so we don't like to think we don't ask when we don't. We like to think we don't ask for too much support from the Mid Diablo team, but when, when we do, we have found them responsive and always very helpful. So we, we've arrived. Uh, Digital Samba has arrived at a place where Janice as the media engine that powers a significant part of the Digital Samba project. Now. From there, no matter how useful we find Janice, it's on its own, does not solve every problem. Um, I, as, I, carrying media across the internet is expensive, it's resource intensive, which makes it ultimately expensive. So we, as, as from Rob's earlier slide, we do prefer a physical server-based deployment strategy. Um, We've, we just it's a, we feel there's more certainty there, and we prefer to de deploy our components like that. With but with Janus, and if you want to with media, if you want to carry a lot of media, a lot of across the internet at scale, you, you, for for short periods of time, you can't be left with a situation where we have ninety percent servers, physical servers sat around dormant ninety percent of the time. So we do have to go on demand on demand. And we do need to go. I so we I so we we have went to on demand route, and we've chosen a couple of EU based cloud providers. We we elected to use two providers for for redundancy and resiliency reasons. Uh, plus the the European based stuff that Rob has already talked about. We we use instances from these providers, and and much the way you would use an AW two ECD EC two instance. They, their APIs are very similar. Uh, both these vendors have quirks in their pricing models, but but we have found that they they're actually can be a bit cheaper than AWS. So don't be be married under these American <laughs> super companies. There, there's other vendors out there, and they might even find you can get a bargain here or there. Um, so this is an interesting contrast from Dennis's speech. Um, he's went the Kubernetes route. We chose a slightly different route. But we're both trying to solve similar problems. Um, so within this, so again, this is horizontal scale. We arrived there in the same way as Dennis and his team has. Um, so roughly how we do this is we, we sort of pull the servers um, and for certain metrics. Once the server has about 300 users on it, once the server is with 65% CPU usage uh, or 65% bandwidth, let's just we say, right, we're, it's probably time now where we need to get another server going. It's sort of on that basis that we start new servers. I remember Dennis mentions on about 50%, and you have this air on the side of conservative. You don't want to let down your end users, ultimately. So it does a simple approach. Like Dennis, we like simple <laughs> approaches that solve complex problems and for this this is what does work really well for it. We do have further strands of this logic. For example, we, we would count lobby users as an already subscribing user. So you know so it sort of makes sense that these guys are going to eventually subscribe to streams. So we need to have servers ready for that time when the lobby is released. Um, in the worst case scenario 
there is about 30, 40 second time wait. If we don't catch it, we don't have the server ready. But our goal is they have media servers ready at all times to support whatever load is on our platform at any particular time, whether these these spikes and load are predictable or not predictable. We our target is always to have the, the servers ready for them. Um, so, uh, so this is the, the video conference use case. This is where we, we again use the video plugin. We, we are talking very similar tech stacks, and um, we allow up to 100 publishers per room. We, we spread rooms across media servers and allocate new rooms to the media, allocate a new room to the media server of the lowest resource usage when that room is created. If again we run back and not fall back, if all, av all available media servers are reaching those resource thresholds that I mentioned earlier, we, we start new instances to support the, the growing number of rooms that are on our platform. Um, the other use case is the webinar use case. And this, again, we, I've noticed a couple of talks, and we've all seen be arriving at similar solutions where we're using the video plugin, the video room plugin for publishers, and then the stream plugin to support an increasing <laughs> amount of subscribers. Um, uh, so, so right now we, we allow about 30 publishers per room and up to around, up to 2,000 subscribers. That, that is a wee bit arbitrary and we're just sort of at this minute we're saying we can, we've load tested as far as 2,000 but theoretically and as long as our front ends can also support this, we can, we can keep going. We can keep pushing this number up and up and up because the underlying technology from Janus supports that, that allows us to do things like that. So, it's just similar. So the way we use it, it's very simple. Again, we have the video room plugin, and then we have streaming room plugins, and we mount the publishers' streams on this streaming plugin RTP forward. I mean, again, we can just go, you know, hundreds of these RT these streaming plugin servers to support very, very large webinar type uh, events. So, as a part of this. Scaling strategy, we did contribute to the Janus support. I think it's worth mentioning this. I think uh, collaboration and contribution to these type of projects is important. And and this is what we did here was we just allowed we allowed for batch configure support for the streaming plugin, which allows us to send all streams that a user needs to subscribe to in one request. We're all very our team was very proud of this small contribution, but it's made under the Janus. Code base, so we're quite pleased about that. <laughs> um, okay, so this is an interesting one. Maybe and Dennis, me and Dennis, gonna have a fight later about this, but um, I'm sure there's some DevOps people asking why have you picked this scaling strategy? It's more in house, it's more our own internal logic rather than going towards automated scale scaling strategies such as Kubernetes and. For us, I, we 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 want we feel more com comfortable taking complete ownership of the scale and logic. So we're better placed to understand it, debug it, and and move towards improving that logic rather than you know questioning some Kubernetes cluster. What happened that time? There was no server there for all them users. For us, we just prefer the ownership and rather than giving it away to some other uh, tech stack right now. But me and Dennis maybe could debate about that. The pros and cons of that later. Um, so ultimately, I, we want to own the logic, and it feels it's all on us. It's on us and our development team. Um, um, I, so we uh, let's think the best way of doing this. So we have been experimenting with with, with Saul's Skynet project, and I've um, we, we're taking another risk. We were going to generate the transcript of this meeting and then also the summary, just to show how we're trying to stitch other open source projects into our tech stack. Um, we were just putting it out there as, and just seeing how our customers receive it. We do like the idea of um, you know, using custom prompts in Skynet. We don't, we don't know exactly how we can offer you know, enhancements to it or improvements, but... Um, yeah, that's roughly where we are. Um, because when I found Saul's project on at that Fodsum demonstration, he, he was using, you know, he, he's trying to solve very similar problems we have, where we, we want to be 
careful about the customer's data. We want to keep it private. We cannot be sending data off to the US to get warehoused, processed, whatever these big players are doing with our data. So we want them all locally hosted LLMs and we're trying to make them cost effective. So using quantized models, so that makes them more accessible and and um, I, and more accessible as as more building blocks that we make a better product. Um, I think so, I don't want to take too much of Saul's thunder because I think he may talk talk about his Skynet and the and the and the, the I think his presentation is tomorrow. Um, I so what I can try to do here is another quick little demo. Um, let me see with the Alton tab. Um, whoops. Ah, escape, of course. Yeah. Right, so I've made this very primitive little UI. It's just to give you a visual of, of how our API works. It's just to make it a bit more visual. So I've from here, I've already saved the, the room from where we're doing this presentation. And I'm just hoping we can get a transcript for it. All right, so that's the transcript. It's just a JSON file with each speaker. Um, from there, I'm going to try and run a summary of it. And I hope this works. And um, we're just using Saul Skynet straight out of the box. It's amazing how accessible he left it and how easy it is for us to use. So there's the summary started now. It's in progress. I'll just double check his back end. And it's away now processing. So I, if you want to try and pass a few minutes for that runs, Robert, that'd be great. <laughs> so while Connell performs his magic trick, I get to distract you uh, with a bit of additional information. But basically what Connell's done here is he's taken the talk that we've just given and is running it through the summarization engine so it was transcribed and, and is now being uh, summarized as we speak. We'll look at that in just a second. Um, so this is the first time in 20 years we've printed stickers. You all have some of those in your goodie bags. Uh, so yeah, exciting times for us as a company. Um, we've also given all of you a 50% discount in your goodie bag. So you can either use those yourselves or if you happen to know how to build this stuff yourself, maybe give them to a friend, you know, who, who might need them more than you do. But uh, that's, uh, that's our offer uh, for all uh, JanusCon members. Um, if you were so inclined, these are our social media. Uh, we're currently a little bit poor on, poor on followers on Instagram. So, so please join us. Please follow us. Um, I can see you all raising your phones. Great desire. So that's amazing. Thank you. Um, and uh, in another little toy I have is, um, is something that we built, which is basically a Digital Samba GPT uh, playground. Um, it's just a demo. It's not actually part of our product or anything like that, but it um, uh, is, is a fun thing that we did. And I, if you have not played around with uh, um, ChatGPT's assistance API, I recommend you have a little fiddle. Um, it's quite fun. What we did here is we trained the um, we trained the assistant on our own API documentation, and I can actually help it. So let's just say hello because it's polite, right? And let's see if it's awake. So this now fires off a message to the uh, Digital Samba GPT, which is powered by ChatGPT in this case. Again, not part of our product. This is just as like a standalone application, which, uh, which, which allows you to develop against Digital Samba's API. And let's say, um, give me some, write me some, PHP code to generate room and let's see what it does. So again, this, and what's interesting actually is that I built this application myself without um, any, I don't, I'm not a great coder uh, by any means. So I actually used chat GPT to build this app from A to Z. I didn't write a single line of code, which is uh, absolutely insane um, in, in my opinion, yeah, that this is something that's possible. Uh, You'll see that it's going to output uh, in a little while when it's ready because uh, ChatGPT, at least at the time that I was using it, did not allow you to stream um, the, the response out to you. But it's going to give us uh, some PHP code, which again, it's trained on Digital Samba's API. And there we go. So we now have some hopefully working PHP code, which as I had shown at the beginning of the presentation, really now understands and 
helps you get started as a developer with with uh, with our tool and um, I think that this is something also for us as developers to keep in mind to when we write uh, API documentation for our products, make sure that it's machine readable, uh, make sure that it's well structured, make sure that it's accurate because you, as you know, these tools do not often do not have access to the most recent information. And if you want the GPTs to be able to, you know, help other people with your applications, then you're going to make sure you have to make sure that this, this information is out there and ready because this is, this is how it's going to be used in the future. Or in the in the present, um, Arnold, I hope. Ah, we can see if it's yeah. ran through. You just like get this wrapped up. Um, whoops. All right, so summary. Oh, it's still in progress. That's that now, I think, yeah. Um, it's been five minutes, man, with a little All chink right. in the armor there. All right, good. Well, thanks. So um, we're very close to the end. Um, very close to the end of our speech. Um, please do connect with us on, on LinkedIn uh, or catch us later on if you have any questions. If you have any questions now, um, please fire, fire away while we wait for our summarization engine to complete the, its work. Oh, there it is. Hello. So, Colin is going to read out this summary. Let's read this side. Has developed Digital Samba, a product allowing developers to easily integrate video conference them to their application with just a few lines of code. The solution is designed to be simple, customizable, and scalable using the Janus Media Engine and customized SDK and API. The company's architecture includes physical servers and cloud-based infrastructure with bespoke logic, bespoke logic for scaling based on metrics such as CPU usage and bandwidth. They also contribute to the open source Janus project and have implemented a feature for summarizing meeting notes. So, no, it's pretty good. It's fun. And we'll be taking that out of development next week and give it, just giving it to our end users. And it's a fun little tool and it's quite good. And thank you, Saul, for it's useful. Are there any questions for Colin, Colin and Robert? I see one in the back. Uh, hi, I'm Mati from Software Mention. First of all, thank you for your courage to run the live demo. It's always uh, appreciated. And uh, the the question that I have on my mind is that you mentioned that uh, uh, you are uh, the solution is privacy first, and I assume that the servers are located exclusively in Europe. If this is correct, how do you deal with the use cases where the end clients are? I don't know from the United States. How 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 does it work from the latency uh, standpoint? Do you have any lessons so, learned over there? I, so, I, so we are EU. We use EU-based service providers with multiple data centers in Europe. Um, but I we have been marketing. It's probably better, Rob's thing. We've been marketing the business as, as EU-centric. So we're looking for EU customers, and we're focused on that market right now. There is. A potential that our it's all Docker components, it's modular, so we can just lift that up and just plonk it in the in the, in the states if and when the business need arose for that. So, yeah, that's roughly where we are with that. So, thanks for the question. It's of course an important one, and this is very much a it was a business decision for us to focus on the European market. Uh, as I said, privacy is ingrained into the digital samba culture. This comes with a trade off. You can't do everything well. Um, at the same time, we do have opportunities in the US, and as Connell says, we will solve them when, when and, and as we need. I, uh, we are running um, a bit way too late. So we, if we have other questions for Robert and Connell, uh, please feel free to reach them because we have lunch ready for us. And then we, we come back here at about 2 p.m. with the talk by Paolo, where we'll be talking about a similar, similar kind of presentation. So I'm interested in, in checking how that, that will pan out. So. 
have a good lunch, everybody. It's the same place where we had the coffee break before. And thanks again to, to DJ Lat Samba for presenting. Thanks. Thank you.